I'm Dr. Catherine Stewart. I'm one of the assistant professors here at Johns Hopkins um, Division of Gynecologic Oncology. And I've taken over as the director of our survivorship program. It's great to see some familiar faces today. And I wanna welcome each and every one of you here today. We're so grateful that you've taken the time out of your weekend to come together to learn more and engage with our community of survivors, donors, volunteers, and supporters. We could not do the work that we do without you. It's been quite some time since we've been able to host an in-person event. Um, and now that we've finally gotten through the trenches of the pandemic, even though COVID seems to be upticking lately, but through the deep trenches of the pandemic, we're excited to get to share with you in person what we've been up to in our division. What we present today would not be possible without your support. And we wanna give a special thank you to all of you who have contributed to the Division of Gynecologic Oncology, whether it be through your time, your talent, or your financial means. There's also signage in the reception area that recognizes donors who have contributed within the past year. Hold on, next slide, it's not working. There we go. Um, I also wanna highlight some of our volunteers and sponsors who are here today with us, who are hosting tables in the lobby area. Um, the Laughlin Family Foundation is actually not here today, but they were planning to be, so I just wanted to give them um, a shout out. We have Courtney Stevens and Deb Petter with the Steph Ripple Foundation, Janice Paulshock and Sandy Fascinoli with the Women to Women Mentorship Program. Um, we have Nancy Long with the National Ovarian Cancer Coalition, and then Jane Yao is a volunteer as well who's helping with the tables today. We also have some, some staff at, from the Johns Hopkins Development Team here today who have been instrumental in helping plan today's event. They can help any questions that you may have. They can help answer any questions you may have with regards to um, volunteering with our division. We also have a volunteer committee sign-up sheet at their table. So if you're interested in learning more about getting involved, please stop by and provide your contact information so that you can be um, notified in the future for any potential opportunities. I'm also excited to announce that we will be hosting our annual 5K Stride and Thrive Run Walk event next June. So it will be June 9th, 2024 at Johns Hopkins University Homewood Campus. It's been a while since we've had this in-person event due to COVID, and so it should be a great opportunity to rally the community together, raise awareness and funds to support our survivorship program. The development team is providing a special giveaway for those who register on site today. There is an area that you can register in the lobby. Um, and so please feel free to go by there and you'll get a free pair of purple sunglasses. I don't have them up here, but I was gonna have one up here to show you. But if you'd like a free purple pair of sunglasses, if you register today, you will get a pair of sunglasses. Also in 2024, we are going to be starting a survivorship, a survivorship small group mini series. This will be a quarterly small group in-person session with a Zoom option, of course, um, that will be hosted here in this space, potentially next door in the little bit smaller area. Each session will have a selected topic on various cancer survivorship um, issues, such as nutrition, exercise, menopause, sexual health, fertility preservation, and more to be coming, depending on what you would be interested in hearing more about. You'll have the opportunity to learn about these specific topics that may interest you and also interact with an expert in a very small group setting. Lastly, I want to recognize that this event would not be possible without the contributions of our former Johns Hopkins faculty member, Dr. Susan Berger. After her cancer diagnosis in 2013, she dedicated herself to empowering gynecologic cancer survivors raising funds to support research and increasing awareness. Dr. Berger served on the Gynecologic Cancer Survivorship Conference Committee, and she also co-founded the, the Below the Belt Stride and Thrive Run Walk, which we are excited to start back up this year. Dr. Berger was a devoted daughter, sister, aunt, and niece, and is greatly missed. Thanks to the generosity of her colleagues, friends, and family, the Susan L. Berger MD Gynecologic Oncology Survivorship Program was created as a way to honor her legacy and provide guidance and support to GYN oncology cancer patients through their cancer care and beyond. The fund supports a variety of programming and resources, which you'll hear more about today. We have entirely too much to share with you in this short afternoon, but today you're going to hear some of the big highlights of the happenings of our division where we and where we were headed in the future. We'll have about a 20 minute break halfway through the session and at that time, um, as well as some um, time after the presentations for you to mingle more in the lobby, visit the information tables, and hopefully consider signing up for the race. So the first item on our program today is actually our keynote speaker, which was one of our survivors. 
I want to recognize and thank both of our survivor speakers, Rhonda Gum as well as Benita Dallas, who in the end could not be here today due to last minute conflicts, but we appreciate their commitment and willingness to share their story with others. Ms. Rhonda Gum specifically asked that I read her comments to the group today since she is unable to do this herself. So bear with me and I'm going to do my best to read her, her comments. So this is the words from Rhonda Gum. So good afternoon. I would be remiss if I did not give the founder of this wonderful survivors group, Dr. Susan Berger, credit for where I am today. This sisterhood was her dream, that none of us would feel alone while dealing with gynecologic cancer. Her words to me were, you will never feel alone in this fight again. Susan showed us by gathering at functions like this to support each other, we become stronger. We are a sisterhood. So I say to you, you are not alone. I was diagnosed in 2015 with ovarian cancer. I had a six pound tumor in my abdomen. It first presented as blood clots in my left leg. I had a clot from my ankle to my groin and nobody could figure out why this healthy 55 year old woman had a clot. Fast forward four months later, I was unable to eat. I could not have a bowel movement and I was urinating all the time. One night I was lying on my back and I laid my hand on my belly. I felt a tumor. I went to my family doctor and had a CAT scan. And on our 34th wedding anniversary, I was told I had ovarian cancer. My family doctor asked where I would like to try, where I, where I would like to go to try to get this disease treated. I, I said, call Johns Hopkins. My husband had previously been treated there. There was nowhere else I wanted to go. I thank God I came here. My treatment was surgery. Oh, and during surgery, I was also found to have uterine cancer. I'm eight years NED. Ovarian cancer has opened me up to so much in my life. We all know cancer changes us in our views on life. What seemed to be a death sentence became a blessing. After meeting Susan Berger and watching all the wonderful things she was doing with her life while being ill herself, I decided to volunteer with KGOS, Kelly's Angels, and Women to Women. I found that infamous silver lining to cancer and what drove Susan to keep going even when she felt like giving up, hope. Volunteering gave me hope. I came to Chemo Infusion Center one day to give out a goodie bag to a new patient. She was in tears, fearful of what was going to happen. I introduced myself. Hi, I'm Rhonda, a volunteer with Kelly's Angels and a mentor with a support group here at Hopkins. We exchanged our cancer stories, chatted a bit about her fears and what makes her what makes her hopeful? It was time to leave. I gave her a brochure about the Women to Women program and said our goodbyes. As I turned to leave, she said, your name is not Rhonda. To me, your name is Hope. With tears, I walked to my car and swore I would never stop giving hope to others going through this dreadful disease. By reaching out to help others through their own experience with gynecologic cancers, I was no longer grieving for my old life. I call it PC, pre-cancer. There has been, there have been many cases where that were hard to deal with. And there have been times when I knew the connection with this other human was meant to be. I have met some of the loveliest people. There have been times I did not think I could do it anymore, but I just can't stay away. So I have spent the past six years, maybe seven years learning about gynecologic cancers, chemotherapy, surgeries, palliative care, mindfulness, alternative treatments, et cetera. If it had to do with cancer, making you a better person to help others, whatever it was, I jumped into it. Not for myself, I'd much rather go shopping or fishing. I felt this was what I was supposed to do. I had no choice. Okay, now the twist in the story. All this time, I thought I was doing this because I had a drive to help others and to learn as much as I could. Here comes what I call a God dart. In May, my husband was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma. How do I help my husband? He's a man. I dug deep in my soul and realized all the things that I have learned from my cancer experience and helping other women. Well, it was meant to be, it was meant to be used to help him too. The man that stood by my side while I was ill, what a turn of events, a God dart, which is why I could not attend today. I'm home taking care of him. My years of training are truly a blessing. I would like everyone here to think about how they could help other women, to advocate for cures, new treatments, to be supportive of that neighbor that is not quite making it with an illness. By doing this, we are gaining strength to use on our own journey. 
Look at all of us. We are a real army of sisters. We are strong, we are hopeful, and we are full of life. We will not crawl in that corner. We will help each other against all odds. We will advocate for new treatments, new testing, and cures. And we will spread the word so other women find their cancers earlier than we did. Each of you, please find one sister to call or stay in touch with, or sign up to be a mentor, to call, sign up for a mentor to call you and check on you, or ask about becoming a mentor. This year, we will be having our fun-filled Stride and Thrive 5K race again. Please sign up. It was, a, it was such a wonderful time for all of us to get together and catch up. If you would like to volunteer with any of the groups, then ask. We would love to have you. I don't know if it's still called Kelly's Angels or if there is a new name, but I am sure if you talk to somebody here, they will guide you in the right direction. Oh, and one more request, get outside. 20 minutes a day in nature changes everything. Sit by water if you can, or just find a peaceful place under a tree to just be. And remember, to whom much is given, much is expected. Thank you. So now I would like to start with our faculty presentations. I would like to welcome our Johns Hopkins Gynecologic Oncology Division Director, Dr. Rebecca Stone. <clears throat> Everyone knows I'm a crier. So that was, I know Rhonda and she took care of my patient, Becky Connell. I so that was very touching. So I'm going to talk about what Rhonda referred to as PC, pre-cancer. And, you know, since our theme today is hope, I want to tell you about the game-changing discovery of ovarian cancer prevention. You know, a person is diagnosed with ovarian cancer every 40 minutes. Screening has never proved effective. And every single person who endures treatment for this disease suffers. This is as true today as it was almost 20 years ago in 1994. 1994, it was a really impactful year, marked by numerous geopolitical, technological, and medical breakthroughs. Nelson Mandela was elected the first Black president of South Africa and overthrew apartheid. The World Wide Web, aka the internet, was invented. The first smartphone became available for purchase. And Mary Claire King, a woman who grew up thinking that working in science meant assisting a man and proved it wrong in every way, discovered the BRCA1 gene. And she was the first to show that breast and ovarian cancers are hereditary as a result of BRCA gene mutations that are passed down from generation to generation. And as this realization crystallized, risk-reducing surgery was born. The practice of removing the ovaries for genetically high-risk women due to BRCA mutations and the like to reduce their lifetime risk of developing ovarian cancer. Now, here's the thing. When the ovary is removed for this intent, so is the fallopian tube, because the viability and sheer purpose of the fallopian tube is linked to the ovary. No point in keeping that organ if the ovary comes out. And so at the dawn of risk-reducing surgery in the late 1990s, the fallopian tube was just sort of cast aside so that people could pour over the ovary, looking for the precancerous changes they thought would be there that were giving rise to ovarian cancer in high-risk patients. But as much as people looked for them in the ovary, they were simply not there. And this was super perplexing. Until one day in 2001, a Dutch gynecologist happened to look at the fallopian tube under the microscope and for the first time saw the precancers everyone had been hunting for. And this was the light bulb moment when we all realized that high-grade serous cancers, which make up 80% of ovarian cancer, don't actually come from the ovary, but from the fallopian tube. And then over the next 15 years, scientists amassed loads of molecular and genomic epidemiologic data to support this theory of the fallopian tube origin of ovarian cancer. 
There were large population-based studies in the United States and Sweden that showed that bilateral salpingectomy or removal of both fallopian tubes achieves at least a 65% risk reduction in ovarian cancer. And our friends up north in Canada have been tracking the incidence of high-grade serous cancer for years now in 26,000 women who had their fallopian tubes out at elective hysterectomy or sterilization, and they've not seen a single case of high-grade serous ovarian cancer. Why the fallopian tube? Well, the reality is that the fallopian tube is under constant attack by the explosive events of, ovar of ovulation and menstruation. I mean, ovulation, look on that like upper right-hand side, right? It looks like the birth of a star for God's sakes. And it causes this like tremendous mutagenic, you know, DNA damage to the poor fallopian tube, especially its fimbriated end, which is like dang dangling right there by the ovary. And this happens every month. The other thing is that most women have some retrograde menstruation and retrograde menstruation is when uh, your menses and some of the endometrium, instead of all coming out the vagina, some of it refluxes back through the fallopian tube and it lands in the abdominal cavity and then it sort of settles out there in the most dependent part of the pelvis. You can see that in the lower right-hand corner. And then the ends of the fallopian tubes, those fimbriated ends just marinate there for days where they're subject to further genotoxic stress that causes even more mutations to accumulate. And all this starts when we're like 11 or 12. And it's the lived experience of the fallopian tube for decades until menopause. So, you know, since the most common and deadly type of ovarian cancer, high-grade serous cancer appears to originate in the fallopian tube, it's natural that people are beginning to ask, well, do we need to remove the ovary so early or even at all for high-risk women? Or is risk reduction sufficiently achieved with removing the fallopian tubes by age 40? And there's a big international study that's looking at this right now for high-risk women with BRCA mutations and, and, and ones like those. Two years ago, the Scientific Advisory Board of Breakthrough Cancer Foundation approached me and they asked me, do I have any good ideas about how to cure ovarian cancer, particularly for the 80% of people who seem to get it sporadically or, or unpredictably, not to a gene mutation? And I'm a simple-minded surgeon, so I was like, no, I don't have any good ideas, but I can tell you how I think we might be able to prevent it. And that really changed everything. As it turns out, hundreds of thousands of women undergo abdominal surgery in their post-reproductive years. They seek surgical sterilization. They have hysterectomies. They have their gallbladders out. They have hernia repairs. What if we use these windows to offer women the opportunity to also have their fallopian tubes out as a primary prevention strategy for ovarian cancer? Well, in the GYN space, we've named this opportunistic salpingectomy. We've been doing this for some time. Salpingectomy means fallopian tube removal, and opportunistic denotes timing that is concordant with another abdominal surgery, like a hysterectomy or a cholecystectomy, when the surgeon is already there anyways. And adding on fallopian tube removal is low risk, takes minutes to perform, and the post-reproductive fallopian tube has no known form or function. This is in contrast, of course, to the ovaries, which we now think actually make hormones long after menopause. So, you know, the projected benefits of this are really potentially huge. And so simply offering universal salpingectomy at the time of a hysterectomy and in lieu of tubal ligation for surgical sterilization, we estimate that we might be able to prevent almost 2,000 deaths per year from ovarian cancer and save almost half a billion U.S. healthcare dollars. If we also were able to make salpingectomy an option at the time of non-GYN surgeries, we project that there would be 8,400 fewer cases and 5,800 fewer deaths from ovarian cancer per year of surgery nationally in the US. Think about this for a moment, that we can significantly reduce the lifetime risk of a lethal cancer that affects one in 78 women that has no screen by simply removing an organ that doesn't have any form or function after childbearing is complete with a short, low-risk surgical procedure is a game changer. 
And you're probably thinking by now, well, this game changer, it seems like it's a no brainer and you're right, but it's a challenging no brainer. To start with, most doctors outside of OBGYN are unfamiliar with reproductive anatomy and physiology, let alone you know, this fallopian tube origin of, of many ovarian cancers. There's no established approach to integrating a surgical procedure for cancer prevention that spans across surgical specialties, right? A colon surgery that needs a GYN to come in, for example. We have these silos in medical training and institutions that are based on specialty specific subcultures. And, and these really undermine the teamwork that's needed to care for patients in new ways. And so making salpingectomy for prevention a standard of care really requires radical like collaboration between GYN and non-GYN surgeons. And it's gonna be disruptive to medical and surgical culture. And then lastly, you know, given the overlap between salpingectomy for prevention and surgical sterilization, state and federal policy, as well as medical coding and insurance reimbursement present formidable obstacles. For example, existing Medicaid policy preclude patients in many states from selecting salpingectomy over tubal ligation for surgical sterilization. But I'm really committed to taking all of this on and to leading what is now a multi-institutional three-year endeavor to establish the scientific foundation, infrastructure, and campaign to bring opportunistic, opportunistic salpingectomy to all eligible patients. And a number of key people have joined the cause, thank God, over this past year. Um, you know, starting really at the top left, um, and I know Kara's mom is here today. You know, Kara is my co-lead on this at Sloan Kettering, and, and I could never, ever, we, we could never dream of doing this without each other. We owe a debt of gratitude to Tyler Jacks and the BTC leadership, you know, for their funding and guidance. Elizabeth Apelles and her team at Greater Than One are working with us on a communication strategy and our national website build. Tom Bauer and his team here at Hopkins and people like Frank Scully with BioDigital, Ray Tierforest at Armstrong Institute have partnered with us to create first of kind patient and provider education materials. The American College of Surgeons is on board. The OCRA is working with us on patient advocacy. On the policy side, we have Andrea Wolf and now Patrick Cooney. Angela Belcher at MIT, Yiming Shi here, have really aligned with us in our work so that this is not just a massive public health campaign, but also that it advances our understanding of and our ability to image and to, de to detect high-grade serious precancers in the fallopian tube. And then we have Donna and Tori and Ji Young, all junior investigators who I've brought onto the team to mentor and to spearhead research. Even my patients and their loved ones, uh, Jane Stunkel, Karen Stoddard, Eileen O'Neill, to just name a few, have been so generous in their support of this work. Because for us, science, this science is deeply personal. This is our mighty and diverse task force at Hopkins Medicine. Max and Sunil and I spoke about two years ago um, in the operating room about bringing ovarian cancer prevention to just routine urologic procedures and they basically made it standard of care overnight. And they even published a call to action to their subspecialty for preventative salpingectomy. And it really makes sense to me, you know, for Hopkins to be the heart and soul of all of this work. You know, after all, we're the birthplace of modern surgery. And it's our shared commitment to raising the standards of surgical science and practice that gets us around the OR table every day to save people's lives. As of 5 a.m. Friday, I catalyzed the formation of the International Task Force on Salpingectomy for Ovarian Cancer Prevention, a vanguard of 34 thought leaders across 10 countries who have had increasing activity in this space over the past 20 years. And our own national website will go live later this month in celebration of GYN Cancer Awareness Month. And of course, my biggest heartfelt thank you to all of our patients who are a constant source of inspiration for this immense endeavor and so many of the other things that we do in the division. This honors your lives and for those who we have lost, it honors their memory. Thank you. And now I'm gonna introduce my colleague and friend, Kim Levinson, who's gonna to talk to you about what we've been working on in the area of cervix cancer. Thank 
you. All right, thank you, Dr. Stone. Um, it's such a joy to be here and to see everyone here gathered today um, and to be a part of this wonderful conference and share with you some of my passions and some of the work that we're doing here at Johns Hopkins in the area of cervical cancer. Um, so cervical cancer has been a long passion of mine, um, primarily for the point that, you know, this often is a disease that in my mind, we should be able to prevent. Um, we know this is a disease that's caused by a virus, the human papillomavirus. And, you know, with so many viruses, even when we think about COVID virus, for example, we can rapidly come to find ways to get our immune systems, have, you know, um, vaccines and those kinds of things that fight these viruses. And yet so many women still battle with this cancer. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of background first, just to kind of recognize where we are with this disease currently. Um, and globally, it's really important to think about where this disease affects the most women. Um, cervical cancer still affects over 600,000 women a year. And most of the burden of this disease really is in low and middle income countries. And you can see that here in this slide. Um, so about nine out of 10 new cervical cancer cases occur in low middle income countries where access is limited to vaccination and screen and treat programs. And in addition to that, women who are immunocompromised, particularly women with HIV, are six times more likely to develop cervical cancer than women who are not living with HIV. And this is due to the immune system's ability to fight the virus and to clear the virus. And so often I'll explain, you know, the human papillomavirus kind of as the common cold of sexually transmitted diseases. So just about everybody gets it if you haven't been vaccinated, but most people will clear the virus on their own. Occasionally it hangs around and causes a pneumonia or in this case, cervical cancer. And it's those women who tend to have less ability to clear the virus for whatever reason that cervical cancer can grow and obviously develop. There's a World Health Organization elimination strategy which was proposed, which aims to eliminate the disease by 2030. And so the goal is really that 90% of girls will be fully vaccinated with the HPV vaccine by the age of 15 years old. 70% of women will be screened with a high performance test, primarily HPV testing. And 90% of women identified with cervical disease, pre-cancer or cancer will receive treatment and care. And of course, a lot of this is going to be in low and middle income countries. So it's important to recognize that we do have several forms of prevention. We do have means that have really reduced incidence of cervical cancer, primarily in places like the United States. Um, we have primary prevention methods, such as the, the Gardasil vaccine, which does prevent many high-risk HPV types in girls who have received the vaccine prior to sexual debut. And then we do have very promising um, screening strategies, which can target precancers, identify precancers, and offer treatment to women who have precancerous changes of the cervix. This does often, of course, involve surgery. It involves constant screening, biopsies, continued follow-up, engagement with the healthcare system, and again, surgical procedures in young women, which can affect fertility and future desires for pregnancy. And so there are many different ways in which we want to continue to enhance the means of preventing and treating both cancers and precancers of the cervix. And this is really where um, this talk is focused. So the cervical cancer score here at Johns Hopkins is what I'm going to talk a little bit about. And I want to introduce this concept of what is a score. So this is a specialized research program of research excellence um, that is administered through the National Cancer Institute. And it was established in 1992. And these are essentially large grants given by the National Cancer Institute, which are focused on one particular area or region of disease. And so these particular score grants 
focus on combining basic science and translation and clinical product projects that are aimed along the continuum of cancer care. So from prevention to treatment of cancer. And each focus is on a specific organ site. And you can see here that I've listed out the different scores that are currently um, offered by the National Cancer Institute. And there are more than 77 score grants that are offered. And one of them is in cervical cancer. And that, cer that cervical cancer score is here at Johns Hopkins. And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it and what the score is doing and what the projects are and what we're aiming to do. So SPORE programs, as you can see, involve all these different components and projects, and a lot of infrastructure is necessary to support these different projects in a SPORE grant. And so there's multiple different projects. You can see the programs here listed out. There's different career enhancement grants that are given. So for researchers that are coming up to try and promote new research, there's developmental projects. So people who have new ideas, mostly in basic science. And then there's also these different cores, which are aimed to support the projects that are in the score. So there's an administrative core, there's a biostatistical core, and there's a tissue core, all of which are aimed at supporting these different projects within the SCORE grants. In our particular project, there are four different um, projects that we have proposed and are working on. And they really range from prevention to treatment of cancer. And you can see, so this schema here shows from normal cells to progression of precancers and to cancers across the continuum here with the cervical cancer cells. And you can see that there's different projects that line up with each of these different areas where we're focused on trying to prevent and treat this disease. And I'm gonna to talk to you specifically about the primary project that I'm working on, which is for a therapeutic vaccination that specifically addresses cervical precancers. So as I had said, when we detect cervical precancers, which is great that we have a means to do so, our primary treatment is really at the abnormal cells and not at the virus. And the problem with that is that if we never get rid of the virus, then the virus can come back and we can be in the same situation again, where we again have cervical precancer cells, and we're in this continuous spiral of detecting virus, needing biopsies, needing to retreat, needing to retreat patients so that we can prevent a cancer. And our goal with this therapeutic vaccination is to try to get rid of the virus itself. So this is a unique virus that was actually developed here at Johns Hopkins. And what we found is that, you know, with, with DNA vaccines, what we found is that we can target the virus, but the issue that we have is actually getting enough of an immune response to get our bodies to recognize the virus and get rid of it. So we can wake up the immune response, but the response is not strong enough. And so there's several ways in which this vaccine itself, as well as some of the ways that we're giving the vaccine, are really aiming to increase that flag to the immune system and say, hey, go get that abnormal virus, okay? And so one of the ways that we're doing it is the vaccine itself and how that vaccine attracts the immune cells to recognize the abnormal aspects of the virus. And then the second way that we're doing it is with this little device down here, which is called the TriGrid integrated device, which basically stimulates the muscle of the arm as the vaccine is given. And so there's a muscular stimulation there that actually shakes the muscle of the arm a little bit when the vaccine is given. And what that does is it alerts the immune system, sends the immune cells over to that area where the vaccination was given. And what's been shown is that when we give a vaccine in that way, that actually increases the immune response by eight to 10 times, okay? And so this, um, between this vaccine and the way in which we're giving it, what we've shown even in our preclinical models is that I know these graphs are kind of hard to look at, but even if you just look at the difference of where these graphs are, so these lower areas here where you see these low blue bars, that's when we give a vaccine just the regular intramuscular way. 
And when you look at these big blue bars here that are going up, that's the immune response when we give it by that system that stimulates the muscle. And then on the far side here, what our preclinical studies showed is that when we give this vaccine to mice, where the immune system is immunocompromised, where we're replicating, for example, an HIV, a patient living with HIV, what we've shown is that we still can get an immune response, even in immunocompromised mice. And so that's extremely promising in terms of being able to administer this vaccine, not only to immunocompetent patients, but also potentially be able to get rid of this virus in patients who are immunocompromised. And so I just wanna share a little bit of our preliminary findings. Um, we have um, almost 15 patients enrolled in this trial, both immunocompetent and um, immunocompromised patients. And six out of seven patients have cleared both the virus and their precancerous lesions of the patients that we've given this vaccine to. And the one patient who did not clear had a much smaller lesion and was in the lowest dose cohort of the vaccine. So this is very promising. Um, that also includes one HIV positive patient who has completely cleared their virus. And um, this is, a figure that shows that. So this is, this first graph here is a picture of the actual HPV results from our HIV positive patient who was included. And you can see how persistent this virus was. And this vaccine affects this HPV type 16. And you can see here at six months, that's all of a sudden gone. Okay. even though the other types of HPV, which this vaccine does not target, are persistent. And then on the far side, this is our second HIV positive patient who actually has only had three months post-vaccine. And you can see her lesion at the baseline. And then just a month after her vaccination, how much smaller her lesion is on the vulva. And so we're seeing some significant clinical effects, even in HIV positive patients, um, which is really profound and very exciting. So what are our next steps here? Fortunately, all doses do appear safe. And so that is one of the primary things we're looking at. We are looking at enrolling six more patients in our HIV negative arm. We're enrolling six more patients in our patients living with HIV. Um, and then um, we also are looking at trying to clear human papillomavirus before transplantation for those patients who are gonna undergo kidney transplant so that hopefully we can get rid of their virus before they become immunocompromised as well. And the goal here really is to cure the virus before you know, any transplantation. Um, I wanna acknowledge the SPORE team. This is obviously a huge undertaking with you know, a lot of different people involved. Um, and so this really is a team of researchers who um, do quite an extensive and amazing job and, and have spent years and years and years developing vaccines and programs focused on this. And um, I think creating a really promising um, and exciting program. So thank you for your attention. Oh, Dr. Gayard is on Zoom. Excellent. Okay. Sorry. No worries. <clears throat> Hopefully you all can hear me okay. I apologize that I can't be there in person, but I'm glad to be able to participate and not risk um, anybody getting sick. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about um, clinical trials in our clinical trial program. Next slide. Hopefully someone will advance for me because I don't have control of the slides. Thank you. All right. So, um, so really, this is just meant to stimulate some ideas about clinical trials and um, for patients and, and their loved ones to talk to the physicians about uh, clinical trials and whether one is, is right for them and where they are in their journey. So next uh, slide. 
So there are certainly a, a lot of questions I get about clinical trials. I'm going to kind of discuss some of them um, and you know why people consider clinical trials and how to go about finding one. Next slide. So first, what is a clinical trial? Well, there are research studies involving people, and they can be done for a number of different reasons. Um, in particular, we think about clinical trials that are being used to treat cancer, and those are the ones that our group focuses on, um, specifically in the interventional studies. Um, but there are also some that are about finding and diagnosing cancer or preventing cancer and uh, both Dr. Stone and Dr. Levinson mentioned some of the studies that are ongoing um, in that regard. And then you can also, there are also clinical trials that are focused on management of uh, side effects or the symptoms of cancer, but not directly treating it. Next slide. So the goals of therapeutic trials or interventional trials is to develop successful cancer treatments and hopefully so patients who are diagnosed with cancer can live longer, better lives. Um, we work on trying to determine whether these uh, new therapies are safe and effective, um, whether they work better than current treatments, and whether they improve quality of life during and after treatment. Next slide. So clinical trials are the key to making progress against cancer, and I can't emphasize this enough. Every new drug, drug combination, strategy that we use in the treatment of a cancer is um, only comes to fruition because of clinical trials. Next slide. Unfortunately, only about, nope, go back one. Yeah, so only about 5% of women with a gynecologic cancer in the United States participates in clinical trials. And I want to emphasize that fact because it's really critical that we understand that involvement in a clinical trial actually helps us make progress against cancer a lot faster. And so if we can increase the number of women who participate in, cl in clinical trials, we can get answers to the questions, find out whether these treatments are working and develop them faster to get them out to everybody else. So that is the key message I want everyone to take away with it today is that clinical trials are key and that not enough women are participating um, in clinical trials. And so I want to encourage you to get the word out for patients to seek out clinical trials. Next slide. Okay, so just very briefly, I want to touch on that there are different phases of clinical trials. There's the preclinical phase, which is not done in people, that's evaluating um, drugs in labs and in animals. And then it enters into the clinical trial phase. There's phase one, finding the dose and figuring out how it works in people. Phase two, early look at efficacy of the drug. Phase three is confirming safety and efficacy. And it's based on these phase three studies that often the FDA is evaluating whether or not they'll approve the drug. And then there can be post-marketing or phase four studies. Next slide. All right, so why do patients choose to go on clinical trials? Well, there can be a many number of reasons. So it can be because the standard of care in that setting may have limited efficacy, so they're looking for something better. Or there's a new drug that has been deemed very exciting, but it's only available on a clinical trial and not yet available as standard of care. Some women seek out um, clinical trials because they recognize that they may receive improved care. There's a lot closer monitoring um, and frequent access to nurses and physicians while on a clinical trial. And then some women do uh, or participate on clinical trials because they want want to give back. They want um, for us to learn about their disease and help other women in the future. Next slide. So why not participate in clinical trial? Well, certainly if there's not a trial available at the time uh, that a patient needs it, um, or if standard of care is considered to be better than the drugs that are currently offered or available, um, then a clinical trial is not appropriate. Or if for some reason it's going to uh, be too man a demanding impact quality of life doesn't align with what um, the patient's goals are, then it's not 
uh, the right time to participate in a clinical trial. Next slide. All right, so when a common perception and something I frequently hear is that we should only do a clinical trial when there's no further standard of care option available. And I can't tell you how wrong I think that is. Next slide. So my opinion is that it's appropriate to consider a clinical trial whenever standard of care therapy falls short of the goal of curing or treating the disease without substantially affecting quality of life. And I would say that in most circumstances for GYN cancers, we still have a lot of progress that needs to be made and clinical trials are the key to making that progress and can be considered. Next slide. All right, so here's just sort of an example of uh, what a treatment course might look like uh, for a patient with ovarian cancer. Um, and there can be clinical trials that are performed at multiple points of, uh, along this course. So certainly before the patient's diagnosed, they may be involved in prevention studies, or at the time of diagnosis, they, um, they may be involved in diagnostic studies. Most women are treated with some sort of um, surgery up front and then um, they receive chemotherapy and perhaps a maintenance therapy. And then there's second line or third line therapies down the road. And what's most important is that patients need to make sure that the treatment population of the study matches where they are in their treatment course. So you don't wanna enroll in a um, study for third line therapy if you've just been diagnosed and um, are going through first line therapy. Next slide. Okay, so where? Obviously Johns Hopkins is a place to um, get clinical trials, um, but there's a number of different places that run them as well. So next slide. Community oncologists will have access to some clinical trials. This may be a little bit more limited, but they're, and oftentimes are more restricted to larger phase three trials. Next slide. But there are now larger um, programs like this NCORE program, which is the NIH uh, Community Oncology Research Program that does allow for community oncologists to provide clinical trials for patients. And they provide something different than um, what is available through other centers. Next slide. Such as academic medical centers like ourselves, the NCI designated cancer centers, or the NIH slash NCI directly. What's most important is that the center must have an infrastructure for the conduct, uh, to conduct the clinical trial. Next slide. So I just wanna briefly introduce my team. This is the Hopkins Women's Malignancies Research Team. We have our four fabulous research nurses in the center and then a whole group of um, study coordinators, program managers, data managers, et cetera, who help us um, to make sure that studies are running smoothly, that we get them up and running, um, and that uh, we're following all the protocols. Next slide. Here's just a few examples of some of the various different clinical trials uh, we have. In green are ongoing trials. Red are trials that are um, coming soon uh, within the next few months. These are a list of ovarian cancer studies. Next slide. We have some for endometrial cancer and cervical cancer as well. And these are all treatment studies, so only um, for patients who have uh, active disease. Next slide. All right, so how do you access a clinical trial? And first and foremost, I would say it's important for the patient to talk with their doctor. They can also look for second opinion at centers that perform clinical trials. Um, there's support through NCI and going online to find NCI supported clinical trials. There are some clinical trials matching services. You can always talk to other patients and support groups as well to find out about clinical trials. Next slide. So which trial? That obviously depends on what the available um, studies are. Um, when deciding, you want to take into consideration a number of different factors, such as the phase of the study, the drug, where you are in your treatment. And it really should be a decision between you and your treating physician to determine if this is a study that's right for you. 
Next slide. There's a whole list of questions. Um, I made handouts available. I don't know if they were printed since I couldn't be there in person, um, but if not, we can get them to you if you're interested in, in seeing what kinds of questions to ask when considering a clinical trial. Next slide. All right, so again, clinical trials are the key to making progress against clinical uh, against cancer, and I would encourage folks to consider enrolling in a clinical trial, which helps speed progress. Thank you. Next slide. Here are some other resources that can be helpful as well when considering clinical trials. And again, I'm so sorry that I can't be there today and in person to talk with you all. Thank you, Dr. Gayard. Um, so now we're going to take a break. Um, so we will re we will reconvene around at 3 p.m. to restart. Okay. And also the handout from Dr. Gayard is at the Gynonc table. If you did not pick one up, she does have the handout out there if you'd like to take one home. Thank you, guys.
just wanted to quickly. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I would like to introduce Dr. Anna Beavis. She's one of our assistant professors in gynecological, in gynecological oncology, and she's going to talk to you about health disparities. Okay, hello. I hope everyone got some great food. Um, the hummus was particularly impressive. Let's see if I can advance the slides. Aha. Uh -huh. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about how we're addressing disparities here at Johns Hopkins, and I think it's important to kind of think back to why Johns Hopkins was founded, why is it in this area of a city that's a pain in the butt to get to with potholes and um, lots of issues with patients who or populations who have really been underserved by the city of Baltimore. Um, and Johns Hopkins' vision was that patients could come here and receive treatment without regard for sex, age, or color and treat the poor of the city and state of all races received to the hospital without charge um, to receive the advantage of careful and skillful treatment. The idea being not that you were providing charity, but that every patient is deserving of the excellent care that we provide here at Johns Hopkins. In gynecologic cancers, women do worse in terms of survival if they are not white. So black women, um, and Hispanic women especially have worse survival and actually higher incidence of most of the GYN cancers. If you have a lower income, you're also likely to do worse. And we're talking months to years of life lost because of that. So a large part of these differences is really due to differences in accesses to resources um, in life. And so we call this on the left, the social determinants of health. So where you were born, what your parents do, where you went to school was predetermined, not by things that you had control over, but you get the advantage or the disadvantage of those things. So your education, your access to healthcare, the neighborhood you live in, um, your social and community um, context and kind of resources and your economic stability are all things that um, are at the community level of your life. And so when patients come to see us, I certainly can't change how much education someone has had or how much income they make, um, but I can potentially address social needs, which are basically the downstream uh, things that people need based on their social determinants of health. And many of our patients come not needing any additional resources, but there's also a lot of our patients who come who may not know to ask for those additional resources. Um, and so we have identified and have been focusing on identifying in our patients these social needs. Food, housing, transportation, utilities, meaning can you keep the lights on, um, and finances are the five essential needs uh, that patients need in order to address uh, their cancer care and just their general health. And we really consider here at PAGOS that this is a part of comprehensive health care and comprehensive cancer care. I want you to try and imagine going through chemotherapy without having enough food to eat having radiation without having a consistent ride to daily appointments and not having a stable place to live while doing cancer treatment. Our patients who have these basic social needs have gone through these things while undergoing cancer treatment. And so our goal at KGOS starting in about 2017 um, was to achieve health equity, not just equality. So I began here about eight plus years ago. I was a fellow for the first three years. And one of the things that I identified in my research was that while we made the equal recommendation and provided equal care for patients, many of our patients were not doing as well because the resources they came to fight their cancer with were less than other patients. 
And you can see here this concept of equity and equality. Equality, everyone gets the same size box, regardless of how tall they are. Equity, we do more for those who have less so that everyone achieves the same outcome. So in 2017, we made a partnership um, with something called Health Leads, which is a community partner which provides resources to patients, basically linking them with community-based resources for the needs that I talked about a second ago. We started by identifying a team. You can see here Kristen Topol was our Health Leads program manager. Um, Maggie Vitali was actually an undergraduate student who approached Dr. Stone and I in order to start this program. So she was really the, the impetus for starting it. Um, and then Dr. Stephanie Wellington was also heavily involved in kind of making this program happen. So we just started by handing patients a piece of paper that asked them, you know, uh, using validated questions, but basically, do you have any of these needs? And then if patients did, and they said, yes, I'd like to be referred to health leads to help me, um, then an advocate, which are actually undergraduate students who are trained to act um, in an appropriate way with patients and help them connect to resources supervised by community health workers, we then call the patient, do an in-depth screening to find out, is there more than just the food insecurity, for example, um, that they mentioned? Is there more that we can help with? And then those patients could either continue to work with health leads every week to address their needs, or if their needs are met, for example, they needed access to transportation and we get them signed up for mobility, um, then they may get discharged from the program. So this was really amazing to start. One of the very first people we screened was a patient that I was giving chemo to with um, Dr. Tanner, who we found had food insecurity. Uh, and we were actually able to get her food during her chemo, which to me was just this proof of concept that our patients have needs that they aren't telling us about, which you can imagine there's a lot of shame associated with not having enough to eat or not having stable housing. Um, and just by asking these questions, we're gonna be able to help patients fight their cancer so much better and again, provide that comprehensive care. However, only 50% of people filled out our piece of paper. Um, not that surprising, <laughs> we give you a lot of paper. So in 2020, um, the pandemic allowed me to write for and receive a two-year grant in order to integrate this whole program into the clinic workflow and into the electronic medical record and try and get rid of some of the barriers we face with paper-based screening. And screening just means asking the patients if they have needs. Just like you screen for cervical cancer with a pap smear, we screen for needs with this questionnaire. So this was certainly not something I could do alone. Um, the first thing we needed to do was kind of build a team. Um, you can see Marie Spielman is up in the upper left. She's our software programmer. She actually can work with our electronic medical record to basically make anything happen. Um, we have many research assistants. These were the ones involved for the last several years. So I have several more now. Uh, Kristen Topol continued on. Now Health Leads is called Hopkins Community Connection or HCC, but it's still the same program. Um, and then some of our undergraduate students who helped match patients for resources are shown at the bottom. And then we decided we needed a name. So we came up with resource equip, meaning equity through quality improvement partnerships. And this whole program was considered part of improving the quality of the care that we provide to patients. So the way that it works, and I'm, many of you I'm sure have interacted with this system, um, is that prior to the visit, we ask the questions on my chart. If, so if you go to e-check-in, there's a resource assessment. Um, not every patient gets it every time because that would be overwhelming. Um, but if they go into their my chart and they fill it out, then, and they want, let's say they want a referral, then a doctor will sign the order and get them referred to the program. If they don't fill it out, then our medical assistant will get an alert um, and we'll do the questions with the patient in person in the clinic. So this will overcome barriers of literacy, uh, barriers of not speaking English, um, or just barriers of using a computer, which is a barrier for lots of patients. Um, and then it's a very simple order appended to us. We sign the orders to Hopkins Community Connection, formerly Health Leads, and they reach out to the patient. Uh, right now, this is currently ongoing just in our Jayhawk clinic, but we will be expanding soon. Many of you may have seen this. This is the my chart view. Um, it asks you a series of questions. As of June 2021, which is when we started the program up and running with the workflow that you could do it in my chart, or it would be done by the medical assistant during vitals, we are screening 97% of patients who we assign the screening to, so up from 50%. 
Um, we've performed over 2,000 screenings and made over 180 referrals. We have found that 30% uh, of patients coming from Baltimore City zip codes have at least one need, compared to about 15% of our other patients who come from further away. These are just some examples of how we've helped patients, and I have hundreds of examples I could have provided. Uh, but for transportation, for example, we helped a patient get medical assistance transportation application completed. So our undergraduate volunteers will literally help fill out physically the form um, and then help it get to wherever it needs to go to make sure the patient can apply. And often just completing the form is a major barrier for a lot of patients. Food, we helped a patient found a, find a food pantry close to her home that she now regularly re visits with her family. I just honestly cannot imagine not knowing if her electricity was gonna be on the week you get chemo or the week after uh, or the months after. Um, we were able to get one patient a four week extension um, of a turn off notice for their electricity bill. And one patient got an $1,800 grant to help with her energy bills. If anyone lives in the city, you know that the water and electricity bills can get real high real fast. And uh, for housing, we helped the patient get a $400 grant to help with her rent, among many other things. So next, we're looking for patient and caregiver feedback, and we've been conducting interviews with patients who've screened positive for having at least one need um, to best understand how they would want these questions asked and this addressed. You know, cancer is a very sensitive time for patients, and these are questions that, again, are associated with a lot of stigma and shame for some patients, and so we really want to be we want the patient's voice in how we ask these questions and, and when and how we provide support. Um, because of this program's success, we're expanding to the actual like Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center um, through a large five-year grant that we're putting in next week. Um, and we actually need cancer survivors and caregivers to serve on the advisory council. Um, so kind of providing the caregiver or patient perspective to the program. If it's something interesting to you, just let me know. I'll be around after. Um, and I just want to highlight that the resource equip program is really one of the ways that we are there for you. Many of you will not ever need this additional help, um, but you may, and there are many patients who do. And it has truly been an honor to be in charge of kind of implementing this program and seeing the, the legacy that continues to live on. So thank you. Um, and next, I will introduce Dr. Fong Liu, who's going to also present on programs and services for current patients. Um, so even more information about what we can do for you. Thank you all so much. Um, is everybody able to hear me? Um, so I'm honored um, to be here this afternoon with all of you to celebrate all the work that's being done by this division. The dedication to our patients and their existence as whole beings can be illustrated no better than all the support services currently in place for patients and their loved ones. These programs perfectly complement the rigorous scientific, surgical, and translational work done on the biomedical side to create a comprehensive therapeutic environment that acknowledges our patients mm -hmm. and their social spiritual, and psychological needs. The first program I'd like to highlight is our GYN Cancer Support Group. It's a, it's a group that's facilitated by our clinical social worker, worker Jen Mansoury, and Amy Brown, our inpatient nurse manager extraordinaire. It's available for any patient at any point in their cancer journey. Each of the three monthly Zoom meetings is peer run. So it's really a setting where patients are driving the discussion on what is important to them and what is concerning them. This um, support group started July of, 20, uh, of this year. And um, if there's uh, anyone here who would like to participate, please get in touch with Jen at the uh, email below or on the slide. 
Another invaluable resource for our patients is the Woman to Woman program. I'm going to spend a little time on this because I think it's so unique. Um, and I've gotten to meet a couple of the mentors here today. And so um, this is really special. It's a mentoring program made possible when the division was awarded a grant from the Ovarian Cancer Research Alliance in 2016. And the program pairs patients with trained survivor volunteers to provide one-on-one -on -one emotional support and mentoring. The coordinator of the pro program, who's here today, Nancy Carusia, has been with the program since its inception working closely with Dr. Burbert at that time and social working worker, Lori Thorner and patient advocate, educator, and liaison Paula Silverman to develop the training and infrastructure of the program. And this development really took um, over nine months. So they really spent um, a significant amount of time making sure that all the mentors and the mentees get the most um, support that they, that they can. The training that each of the mentors undergoes is comprehensive and continual, including background on the cancers that our patients live with and the treatments and their side effects. In addition to effective communication and active listening skills, so crucial to a mentor-mentee relationship. Lastly, each mentor is also taught how to best care for themselves so they can be the best resource for the patient mentee. Nancy holds continuing education and training sessions every three months um, to make sure that the mentors are well supported and up to date on treatments and interventions. So far, 22 mentors have been trained in this program and 115 patients have been matched. Referrals are typically made by the patient's primary physician to Nancy and from her group of 22 mentors, she makes sure that the mentor and patient are well matched. She does this by uh, reviewing the medical records and discussing the patient with the treatment team to understand um, who the patient is as a person. I can't stress enough what a wonderful resource this is for our patients. Um, and we have mentors Sandy and Janice who are here today. Um, and so if you see them, please, uh, please stop them and say thank you. Another incredibly unique program that the division supports is the Brotherhood of Caring. This group is specifically for the male caregivers of women living with gynecologic cancers. It started in September, 2019, right before the pandemic, and they were able to meet once in person before COVID. Um, and as of this year, they've started to meet in person again. Um, they're doing kind of combo Zoom and in-person meetings. The program was born out of a survivorship conference and has been going strong since 2019. The next meeting is in a couple of weeks um, and happens to be on Zoom Saturday, September 23rd for a couple of hours, 11 to 1 p.m. If you guys look up Brotherhood of Caring on YouTube, um, you'll really uh, find you'll find really great videos. Um, on the program where participants talk about what the group means to them, um, why they join, and how it's helped them so tremendously. I encourage you all to watch these videos because it gives you such a clear sense of why support groups for male caregivers um, is just so important. I think for a lot of male care caregivers, this realm of medicine is so foreign and folks don't know how to ask for help when they find themselves in this situation. And the Brotherhood of Caring provides such an incredible way for the men in our patients' lives to feel supported in an open environment. Another program for male um, caregivers is Coffee with Chris. This is a more individualized, one-on-one -on -one, um, sit down with Chris Riley, one of the founding members of Brotherhood of Caring. Chris was a very dear friend of Dr. Burgert's and his life has been impacted deeply by women who have lived with gynecologic cancers. His support of the survivorship program has been steadfast since it started. And I know it would not be the same without his unwavering dedication. The next Coffee with Chris is also in a couple of weeks, September 21st. 
um, from 3 to 5 p.m. And these sessions are held on campus. This one just across the way in the Bellevue Chief State Court. If you're interested in participating, please contact Amy Brown at the number listed in the flyer to get set up. There simply isn't enough um, time to highlight all the current services and programs available for our patients, but this next slide is just a very broad overview covering the other areas, including nutritional um, counseling, pastoral and spiritual support, and the Kelly's Angels program, which provides um, these uh, wonderful care bags for patients mm -hmm. undergoing chemotherapy treatment, um, among other things as well. Additionally, the Steph Ripple Foundation provides direct financial grant support for our patients living with ovarian cancer. And I'd be remiss not to mention our palliative and integrative um, medicine division. Um, they, they do everything to support symptom management um, and achieving uh, quality of life for our patients, which is just integral to their well-being. I thank you so much for your attention. If there are any suggestions on any of these programs, feedback, or new ideas um, for programs, please stop any of us and, and let us know. Thank you so much. Next up is Dr. Ferris, our fellowship director. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Uh, my name is Stuart Ferris. I am honored uh, to be the program director for the uh, F.J. Mons Fellowship in Gynecologic Oncology. Um, my associate program director is Dr. Levinson, who you heard from earlier um, about uh, when she spoke with cervical cancer in our SPORE program. Um, the, the symbol there at the, at, the, at the middle of the logo for Johns Hopkins Medicine, that triangular shaped shield is equal sided and each side represents something. Um, it's patient care, research and education. And our division and our department and the director of our uh, direction of our chair really add another mission of advocacy um, to our charge. Um, but our, our fellowship program really pulls together all the three missions of, of Johns Hopkins Medicine. And so I just want to kind of point out that symbolism. There's a few things um, I'd like to highlight that bring that together. So who are we? So we're a group of folks from all sorts of backgrounds, um, and we're all committed to the same thing, excellence in patient care, education, research, and advocacy, our quadpartite mission. What is a fellowship program? So many of you know that physicians spend four years in medical school after four years of college. We then go on to spend additional training uh, in our field of choice, and that can range from three to four to seven years, depending on which residency program. So we all trained in obstetrics and gynecology, so we spent four years in residency. After that, you can choose to become a subspecialist in many different fields, and gynecologic oncology is one of them. So our fellowship program follows residency, and you spend an additional three to four years getting highly specialized training in a specific field. So our program is a three-year program, and our fellows spend two years in clinical training and one year dedicated in research. We have the best program in the country. Um, yes, that's right. Yes. We don't get to say that very often, depending on who, who we're talking to, but we really do. It's a highly competitive program. We have over 100 applicants every year for the one or two slots that we take. So. Um, we are very blessed to have amazing fellows, um, and many of you have, have met them and worked with them over the years. We not only provide one of the most comprehensive surgical and clinical training programs in the country, but we also do so in, with a commitment to our fellows' wellness. And we have a long history of success, um, and our fellowship has existed in various forms since the late 1970s, which is when gynecologic oncology um, became a subspecialty. Um, and in its current form for now 20 years, it was reestablished in 2003 in the form that it is now. And as I said, I'm very honored to lead the program um, as I inherited it from Dr. Faber. So much kudos to her and what she built. Pictured here are the four founding physicians of Johns Hopkins Hospital. 
Um, so I, I use this to help, help, help underline that deep commitment we have to medical education that remains really at the foundation of what we do. Um, Dr. Osler is the far left seated there. Um, he is known for many things, but was a, a pioneer in bedside teaching and uh, patient rounds. Um, the way that we do it now with medical education uh, started with Dr. Osler. Dr. Halstead, who is standing, his name was invoked earlier, um, is, was a surgeon, was the surgeon in chief of the hospital for many years, pioneered surgical education residency, which we inherit uh, directly. Um, Dr. Welch is in the middle, um, skipping over all the way to the far right, is Dr. Kelly. So Howard Kelly is the namesake of our division. He was a gynecologist and a pioneer in the treatment of uh, uterine and cervical cancers in his day. So our mission of our program is to train the next generation um, of, for gynecological oncologists in excellence in patient-centered care, practice-changing research, and world-class education. And we are very fortunate uh, to be the recipients of um, an ongoing support from the Mons Family Foundation. The fellowship is named in memory of one of the former program directors, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Mons. In training our fellows every day, these are the values that we keep in mind. Um, and our graduates uh, not only receive that world-class training in surgery and chemotherapy, but also a multidisciplinary experience in all the many ways that we need to be equipped as physicians to help take care of a whole person and not just a disease. And we take that very seriously and we are very fortunate to have nurses, pharmacists, chaplains, and many others who participate in our fellows training. Of course, our fellows uh, benefit from an unparalleled surgical experience, um, including minimally invasive surgeries. And as gynecologic oncologists, we also participate in the non-surgical management, such as chemotherapy and clinical trials of our patients' care. And our fellows continue to benefit from the decades of experience amongst the faculty. Our program is a collaboration with Greater Baltimore Medical Center, or GBMC. And there, under the directions of Drs. Levinson and Liu, our fellows get a complementary experience to what happens at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Our fellows have a long track record of partnering with our faculty um, to help invent the future of cancer care and GYN oncology. Our division is very fortunate to have uh, support of many of our current and former patients and their families that uh, help us support this endeavor. As I mentioned before, our fellows spend an entire year focused on research and discovery, and they have a couple of different pathway options. They can do a basic science training, or they could do clinical science training. There's an individual pathway for highly motivated uh, fellows, um, including advanced degrees if they are so um, interested. Our fellows have a track record of being recognized nationally and internationally. Um, some of uh, some of you um, some of you here today have actually supported the work um, that they go on to present. So we are very deeply grateful. These are our current fellows, and I've included uh, where they have trained, where they did their residency. Doctors Goulder and Matthews are our current third year fellows, uh, both of whom have already secured jobs. So we're very proud of them as they graduate next year. Um, Dr. Rushton uh, joined us from University of Alabama. She is our second year and doing research currently. And Drs. Lewis and MacArthur just joined us as newly minted first years. Uh, Dr. Lewis is clinical this year. Dr. Uh, MacArthur is doing uh, a year of research. And then our recent graduates here, and I've placed uh, put on the slide where they went to, just to give you a sense of um, where our fellows go. You may recognize some of their faces. And I think it goes without saying, but we are immensely proud of our fellows and all that they have accomplished Participating in their education makes us better doctors and surgeons. And for those of you who have supported our fellowship, please know that the support you provide goes on to, um, in many ways, impact num innumerable patients. So each of our fellows will take care of hundreds and perhaps a thousand patients in their career, if not a few more. So think about that. It's almost immeasurable the impact that you would have supporting uh, the, future, the future generations of GYN oncologists. Thank you. And last but not least, I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Amanda Fader. Hi, everyone. Thank you.
thanks for hanging in there with us and for coming on this beautiful Sunday, especially during the Ravens, first Ravens game. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the scores in case anyone's waiting to watch it at home, but um, <laughs> Oriole's looking uh, pretty good as well. Um, Dr. Stewart, I just want to give you, a, a, we have all this like, big shout out again, and Dr. and Ashley for just this wonderful program. Thank you so much for reinvigorating this wonderful program. <laughs> And um, Dr. Stewart asked me to talk about our national presence and also the Society of Gynecologic Oncology and our, our partnership and role there. And I sort of retitled this as Local Champions with Global Impact because I think I speak on behalf of all of my colleagues that we live to help our patients live longer, better lives and to champion your health and your wellness and to champion prevention, Dr. Stone and others. Um, and the best possible outcomes when one is diagnosed with a gynecologic cancer. But we hope that our work, as much as we enjoy most taking the personal care of each of our patients at the local level here in Baltimore, we hope that our work really has an impact well beyond Baltimore um, and a national and an even, even a global impact to impact many patients. And so as an academic center, you've heard all of the wonderful things happening and I'd like to talk some about my own work, but really I'm gonna to try to tie it all together with the wonderful things all of our colleagues are doing. Under Dr. Stone's leadership, we each have a, a niche, as you can see, we each are doing something a little bit different, but there are so many problems that uh, and, and, and conundrums that we need to solve within this field to help our patients prevent or live better lives with gynecologic cancers. And so we all have taken a different piece of that pie. And our mantra really at Johns Hopkins has been that we don't just wanna deliver you the standard of care. We want to help you discover it and help tell the story um, and make things better and better and better. Um, so I like to think of this as sort of an acronym of the KGOS faculty, we care. And Dr. Ferris talked about the tripartite sides of the original Hopkins logo, um, that's clinical care, research and education. But our, our chair, Dr. Satin, always adds the importance of advocacy. Um, and we're going to talk some about all the different ways that our faculty lead nationally in terms of those things. But first, I'll just briefly mention the Society of Human Oncology, and Dr. Stewart wanted me to mention, um, this is the premier national and international society for uh, gynecologic cancer prevention, treatment, education, and awareness. I'm very fortunate that I'm president-elect of this society, and I will become president in March. Thank you. <laughs> Give a big shout out to Dr. Stone and all my colleagues for, for helping protect my time to have that role. Um, and I hope I'm the we're the first president I think from Hopkins, not, and not the last because we have so many incredible leaders. But first, let's talk about the C of the care, the setting the clinical standards. And I just want to impress upon everyone how much we care about taking care of patients. That's like the thing we love the most more than anything. But in doing so, we try to study what is the best way to take care of patients. And each of our faculty has taken a leadership role in different ways to help prevent things like infections after surgery, uh, which is one of the number one complications and even killers. Uh, enhanced recovery after surgery uh, led a inter as a global expert by Dr. Stone um, to help define the best perioperative care standards so patients recover faster and better after their big cancer surgeries. Within that enhanced after recovery after surgery, many of our colleagues have also studied how to reduce blood clots, optimize narcotics use. Um, Dr. Beavis is phenomenal um, social resource needs. There's no other program quite like it at any cancer center. And she's presented her work at many national meetings. Decreasing over and under treatment of cancer, something Dr. Levinson and I really want to focus on in cervical and ovarian cancers. Like are the paradigms we're using to treat patients really evidence-based, can we do better? And then we've all, several of us have been part of what are called the NCCN guidelines. This is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, an alliance of academic cancer centers that help establish the standards of care. What are the best treatment standards for every cancer that there is in, um, in all men, women, and children? And, um, and so we've really been fortunate to have a seat at that table over the years. We also have a specialization in rare cancers at our center, something that's near and dear to my heart. I'm a rare tumor girl, um, as some of you know, and we, we really pride on taking care of women um, with uncommon as well as more common cancers, although you could argue that almost all gynecologic cancers are rare. 
don't be surprised if you see our KGOS faculty in the news um, for a lot of this groundbreaking work that's done here. Um, we're very fortunate um, to be able to, to share that information with the general public as it becomes available, whether it's research or clinical care or advocacy. And speaking of advocacy, the way I think about advocacy is how do we, we, we can have advocacy at the institution, how do, uh, that Dr. Beavis talked about, how do we advocate for every patient to see, receive the right care at the right time by the right person? Um, but there's also like national and international advocacy. How do we get better research funding for our cancers? How do we prioritize our patients during a global pandemic? How do we prioritize our patients during an unprecedented chemotherapy drug shortage that I'll talk about in a second? How do we optimize the best access of care? And how do we help prevent the most lethal cancers like what Dr. Stone and other colleagues are doing? And this is Dr. Stone and Dr. Long. Uh, on, they're already famous. They're, just wait to see how famous they're gonna become with their incredible program. Um, and this is not why she's doing it. Um, it, it <laughs> she's the most humble person, but, but, but this, is going, this is a really big deal, um, intersecting ovarian cancer through removal of fallopian tubes. And they're on this media circuit right now, trying to tell the world about the importance of this. So um, kudos to, to, to that team. But advocacy is critical, uh, a critical piece of the, what we call now the quadripartite mission in academic medicine to advance levels of care. And one of the things I've been really passionate about at the SGO, the Society of Gynecology and at Hopkins, is that how many of you knew right now that we're in the middle of the worst chemotherapy drug shortage in US history? Yeah, most of you do, because it's, it's we've been talking to patients about it and in the news. I wanna first say, please don't worry, we're okay at Hopkins right now. We have, we have drug, but this has been really an unprecedented crisis that's probably post-pandemic in nature. Unfortunately, chemotherapy drugs are in the top five of drug classes that are often in shortage nationwide. Um, and this is getting worse over time. And so at the SGO, we've been really laying track as the train is moving. As, as we found out that things were happening, we really got involved at the national level before any other society um, or organization did. And we, we created this survey on the right here of our national SGO members and found that members in 46 states reported a drug shortage or need for rationing of chemo at their institutions. We have been very, very fortunate at Hopkins that we've, we've had wonderful pharmacy teams and leadership here that has helped us prevent that in large part, but several centers haven't been as lucky. And so we've been getting on the social media and the media circuit, we've been advocating, we were invited to give a briefing at the House Cancer Caucus on Capitol Hill we're gonna be briefing in the House Energy and Commerce Committee um, drug shortages uh, hearing that's happening next week. And so we're really trying to take a national road working with the FDA, Congress, the White House, and the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response to not only mitigate the current shortages, but to prevent future shortages. And one thing that you might be surprised to hear, the FDA has a list of essential medicines. Do you know that not a single one of our chemo agents are on that list of essential medicines? ridiculous. So we're really working hard to prevent that so that we can always have a supply of life-saving curative chemotherapy at the ready for our patients. And so I'm not going to go into this in very much detail, but we've taken a really big multi-pronged approach at the SGO and partnered with other organizations like the American Cancer Society, OCRA, and ASCO, as well as local institutions to create alternative drug guidelines for those patients who didn't have access to standard of care drugs. We've done a number of webinars, both for patients, survivors, advocates, as well as providers to help educate them about best practices to keep patients safe and on track with treatment. Um, we've created toolkits um, for our members to help them with uh, insurance authorization when using additional types of treatments. We've done a social media and media blitz as we've talked about, and we've already discussed the legislative and regulatory and policy plans that we're working on. And we're also doing a lot of research on this. So please know that we're fighting on your behalf and um, we will not tolerate this. In terms of the R of care research, um, you've already heard a lot of the wonderful research um, uh, activity happening in our division that's been really focused on prevention, screening, treatment, and disparities in access to care. Just a quick mention of another um, screening possible prevention project happening is called the PAP-Seq. 
we know from Dr. Levinson's uh, work and others, um, you know, that the pap smear has been the single most important um, screening tool in cancer history in terms of reducing the, you know, what is, what are we screening for with pap smears? Cervical cancer, exactly. And it resulted in a reduction of 80% in cancer incidence and death um, when they were introduced in the 1950s in the US. Um, so we're now looking at repurposing the pap smear and looking at what are called tumor driver mutations that may be present in other types of cancers. And what we found in endometrial cancer in particular that the endometrial cancers shed their own genetic material or DNA into the vagina through the cervix and we can potentially pick up these um, known signatures, DNA signatures for these tumors to try to identify these cancers in a novel way that doesn't involve necessarily an invasive biopsy into the uterus. We're, we're a long way off from being prime time with this, but this is a really big uh, multi-disciplinary um, study being done at Hopkins that we're very proud of. Um, and in another way of looking at how, how we can determine screening and prevention practices in our field, Dr. Gayar talked about, um, and Dr. Um, Levinson talked about the, a lot of the trials happening at Hopkins. These are just a number of trials that we're doing um, some of which have been practice changing that our colleagues are leading or co-leading that are international or national cancer institute trials. Um, several of them in the rarest or most aggressive cancers that we really need to find better treatments for. Um, I, I did this incorrectly, but the second bullet there's Dr. Stone's trial. It's an ET, ECT, I can never say it. ETCTM. Ah! Um, trial, um, there's a very novel trial uh, looking at um, uh, an agent called triapine and uh, prior to surgery in patients with uterine serous cancer. I, I study uterine serous cancer as well and I'm doing a number of different trials um, looking at tra targeted therapies in those patients. And one of the most exciting trials that was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine that I was very fortunate to be a part of is um, pembrolizumab, the Im new immunotherapy agent that um, ha has really revolutionized cancer care it, when it was added to keep the standard chemotherapy in advanced endometrial and recurrent cancer, um, we found a significant improvement in remission rates and what we call progression-free survival in patients, um, especially in those who had a particular mutation. And so there's so there's really exciting trials happening here. This is an example of a, an ovarian spore. We have two spores. We're one of the only cancer centers in the country to have two cancer spores, the cervix spore led by doctors Levinson and team, and then the ovarian spore and um, really exciting trial work coming out of that as well. A lot of work in disparities in cancer care um, that, that is getting media attention. Dr. Beavis's work and histamine corrected cervical cancer mortality rates was all over the New York Times a couple of years ago and in multiple media outlets. Um, and really just showcased the, a really large racial disparity that we have in cervical cancer. And then my, our fellow Nerlene, Dave, Dr. Dave Ravine, who just graduated, just did a really important study looking at the geographic disparities. We talked about racial, ethnic, and resource-based disparities in care, but we also have location-based patients who live in rural settings who may not have direct access to large cancer centers or even cancer a doctor for 100 miles or so. And we found that upwards of 50 million women in the US may lack direct access to a GYN oncologist and how we need to kind of rethink that as well. Our work has won a lot of research awards recognized by multiple societies. And I will end by just highlighting again, the wonderful education here. I just wanna give a shout out to Dr. Ferris who did not tell you that he's the lead of the national fellowship research network of all the fellowship directors around the country um, at the SGO. And he's been doing really great work with that. We're also leading an exciting pro program called the SGO Bridges, which we're training the next generation of clinical trialists because we know clinical trials help save lives and advance the standard of care. We want to get this generation of uh, trainees really excited about continuing clinical trial work. And so we have 30 colleagues from around the country participating in the bridge. And it's a bridge from um, the, you know, the bench, bench to the bedside. How do we get the translational science that's done in the lab? quicker and in a wonderful way to patients in a meaningful fashion. Um, and then many of our KGOS faculty and fellows um, are often invited to international national meetings, multiple meetings every year to present their expertise and work, which we're very proud to represent Hopkins. Dr. Stone and I had the pleasure of helping run the 2022 annual meeting on women's cancer for the Society of G1 Oncology. And we're very grateful to partnerships with patients as well 
you help us educate local and regional providers. And this was an inaugural um, conference that Dr. Stone, Beavis, Gayard, and I hosted in 2022 that was uh, par partially sponsored in part by the Lachlan family so that we could really discuss how to prevent um, endometrial cancer and how to improve precision-based treatments. And we had folks from over 14 countries uh, log in for the in-person and hybrid virtual meeting. So thank you so much. Uh, and uh, wonderful to see you all in person. Thank you. All right. So thank you all again for coming and taking the time to join us today. Um, and I also want to thank um, Ashley Ostrega and, and Marty, uh, Marty, Maddie Pardis for helping us um, coordinate this event today. They have been instrumental as well in helping us coordinate this. We could not have done it without the two of you. So a few friendly reminders, feel free to stop by the tables before you leave. Um, we have about 15 more minutes before we have to be out of here. So if you have any last minute questions or anything, feel free to ask um, the different volunteer tables, the development team. If you would like to get involved, please let us know. Um, you will be, um, also don't forget to sign up for the race. If you'd like to sign up for the race today before you go, but obviously you can sign up online as well later, but you just won't get your free pair of purple sunglasses. I know you're dying to have those. Um, you will also be receiving a survey within the next few days of the event. Please take a few minutes to fill it out. Give us some feedback. We would love to hear your thoughts. We also, you know, really appreciate your ideas to help us improve on, on, you know, next, our next events and what you would like to hear and learn more about. Um, so please, when you get that email, please fill it out. Um, lastly, I hope that you learned something today and that we're leaving you with a feeling of inspiration and hope for the future. I also want to once again recognize everyone who makes our mission possible, our patients, our donors, our volunteers, our supporters. We could not provide all of these robust programs and improve patient outcomes without all of this groundbreaking research, without all of your support. Together, we can make a difference and work toward a world without cancer. And I look forward to seeing where we can go in the future. Thank you so much again for coming today. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you so much.